Allison told you, but basically, uh, Free Comic Day is my favorite day of the year, and I turned into a very big whiner when um, they canceled it. Yeah. People were like, yeah, you know they canceled all sports, right? And like the Olympia, the you know the Olympics, and I was like, I don't care. It's not Free Comic Day. I want my Free right. Comic Day. Right. So. Is it? Um, are they're not postponing it either? Like it's. They're gonna postpone it, but um, the first weekend in May is is Free Comic Day, and uh, it always will be. And like I plan for it. Yeah. We spend about um, I don't know, 350 days working for it, wow. and then we run it for four days. <laughs> yeah. We we spend all year working towards it, and so. It was a bit of a hit this year, but we're doing the best we can with what we have. And the thing for me about Free Comic Day is that uh, it's when we show the world our our universe, our hobby, right. passion, yeah. our internal community to the external community. Uh, and that's the biggest, most important part. And uh, so that's how we thought of we'll have virtual Free Comic Day and reach out to the creators and ask questions and things yeah. like that. So that we still can have some talking points and hang out and we're going to do, um, we're going to give giveaways and stuff like that through the day. So hopefully it'll still be something fun, even though uh, it won't be the real thing until hey, later. No, I think we're all taking what we can get at this point, yeah. right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm super hoping, and I'm going to have to remember to call them. We have two families that every year on Free Comic Day, they bring their babies in and we take a picture of them because they were born like on a free comic day or like days before free comic oh, day. Yeah. And they came in on free comic day and it was their first picture. And it, we have little pictures. So every year we have these pictures with these babies. So how, you know. how old are they now? Uh, one of them is four and one of them is six. Okay. So it's, and it's going to be one of those things where it's like, you know, in Twitter moments, like yeah. these kids went to a comic book store every year for free comic book day, watch them grow in these, you know, yeah. <laughs> I have the physical pictures and I'm eventually going to put them all together and put them up, but that's cool. Uh, yeah. So they have to come in. Yeah. But, um, but thank you for being a part of it. Of course. Uh, yeah, I have some questions time. from some customers, but I was hoping we could start off by having you introduce yourself and tell my fine family who you are. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Mustafa. I'm a uh, comic book writer and artist. Um, so, uh, probably most notably, I uh, did a book called High Crimes uh, with my buddy Chris Sabella, and then um, I've done a bunch of James Bond stuff, a um, bunch of stuff at DC and Vertigo, and um, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, speaking of Free Comic Book Day, I was going to have a book announced either on or before at some point. And there was a four-page preview of it in there. So uh, it's not, I don't know when we're going to announce it, but I'm really excited about it. It's my first, like, full-on graphic novel that I'm writing and drawing. Uh, you could announce it now, and we'll announce it on free time. <laughs> that was actually well, one of the questions. I, was, I um, did ask if I could, and they said, well, you could tell them that it's with humanoids, which is who I'm doing it with. <gasps> um, what? But they want to hold off on the actual details, but... Yeah, I'm super excited. It's been a, it's been really fun, and uh, yeah. So hopefully, you know, sooner rather than later. But because that was one of the questions I saw you on Twitter teasing an upcoming OGN. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is there anything you can tell us other than it's with one of the greatest, awesome companies? I'll tell you, it's a, uh, it's, it's a sci-fi thing, <laughs> and it's not like super hard sci-fi, but you mm -hmm. know, um, and. So to be able to to do a sci-fi book at Humanoids was like, right? Wow. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so I'm so excited. I think I love Humanoids as a company more than anyone in my community. So oh, I'm glad we have here. Humanoids uh, like a display, and it literally is right by my desk because I've said I'm the only one that's going to be able to sell Humanoids on the level that I sell them because oh, people walk that, up and I'm like, that really have excites you me of Humanoids? Yeah, let me share it with you. Yeah, they're no, they're fantastic. Like, the, I mean, working with them has been amazing, and you know, they brought uh, Mark Wade in as publisher recently, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he was he was a big champion of of my book that I had pitched to them because I believe at the time he was like a, a creative consultant. I, I don't remember his exact title, but um, so you know, he was really uh, 
supportive of, you know, when I sent my pitch in and, and, Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, to, to be able to, you know, I mean, he's on my Mount Rushmore of comics, right? So to be able to like, you know, email with him and have him, you know, read my stuff and, and, you know, to be able to have the chance to work with him has been awesome. So I can't wait to tell you guys more about it. And, you know, hopefully I can get up there and do like a signing once it's released. And uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Mark uh, is actually one of my other interviews this week. So oh, nice. Uh, and he is a uh, super fangirl. He, uh, he was actually one of my first guests that I ever had in the store. Oh, really? Yeah. And then we saw him like years later and he's like, hey, Gabby, how's the shop? And I was like, you're a mutant. How do you remember me? <laughs> so, I hear really he's cool. a steel trap in terms of like the things he remembers, you know? Yeah, uh, I love it. I love it. So, um, well, did you want me to go on with customer questions or is there yeah, anything else you want to talk about? Yeah. You know, like human as a company or no, I'm kidding. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> so what, uh, basic first question, what was the first comic you remember reading or the comic that like spoke to you the most? So when I was a little kid, um, I got, I, my dad brought home a, a copy of, um, uh, John Burns, Man of Steel, number two. Nice. Specifically the second one. And it came with an audio cassette of like voice actors and sound mm-hmm. effects and stuff. So, and I think I was probably four at the time. This would have been in like 80, 88 or 89. And, mm-hmm. uh, and there was another one that I believe was a Jim Aparo Batman issue. Um, that one did not have a tape, but I, I remember there was like a Birdman of Alcatraz kind of like story where the guy was kind of the bird man of arkham or something it wasn't penguin but it was you know just mm-hmm. kind of one shot thing but but that um that man of steel issue was a big part of how i learned to read because i would listen to to it and then read along with it you know um so yeah that that set me on the path of of superman uh as a little kid and uh you know i loved the christopher reeve movies as most mm-hmm. do but I am a huge uh, Superman 4 supporter, The Quest for Peace. I could go on about why it's a great movie, but I won't bore you with that right now. But <laughs> uh, And then I fell out of comics for a long time. And then when I was in high school, Smallville came on mm. the air. And I was like, oh, I always loved Superman. You know, I'm going to watch the show. And I, I, you know, was super into it. And then somebody as a gift got me um, a, a book that was called The Complete History of Superman. Actually, let me grab it real quick. I have it right here. <laughs> So I received this book here. Oh, nice. And yeah. you, under the dust jacket, it has an Alex Ross painting of the same image. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, excuse me, what? Like, <laughs> you can do that? You can make superheroes look like real people, you know? It, doesn't that one come with, like, a reprint and a doll? No, that, I think that's oh. the big, like, passion one or something. Okay. Um, and then this one also has this spread by Alex mm-hmm. Ross. Mm-hmm. On Earth. Um, and so, you know, just seeing superheroes done in this like very realistic storybook style, there was there was this one too. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just completely enamored with it. And I, you know, I, I had been drawing since I was a little kid. So uh, I, I started to try to reverse engineer, like, what kind of paint is this? Who is this guy? You know, and that led me to uh, Kingdom Come, which, you know, written by the aforementioned Mark Wade. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that book absolutely just sent me down the rabbit hole. And then from there, it was, you know, Superman Birthright, which is another of my favorite Superman mm-hmm. books mm-hmm. by Mark also. Um, and then, yeah, I just kind of just started devouring it. And then, you know, at some point I realized wait people actually do this like and get paid for it and you know Mm -hmm. so i started i wanted to be a cover artist and then i realized like oh the actual fun part is drawing the panels so then you know set off on a journey (laughs) Mm -hmm. well tell us about that journey well um i was um i'm trying to remember how it was like early 20s when i started you know late i think i was like 19 or 20 when i really started reading comics regularly um and i just became totally sucked into you know uh all the classics and then kind of from there you know started to get them on a a weekly basis and stuff and i started to track down like um 
you know, I, Marvel would do those like how to break into comics the Marvel way issues where it would be like an anthology of, of new talent. Mm -hmm. I think C.B. Sobolski like curated it or something and and from people he scouted. So then I from one of those, uh, I learned about podcasts about comics. And then I would, you know, dig up interviews with like C.B. Sobolski and like Mark Chiarello and, you know, different people from Marvel and DC on, you know, breaking in and, and the process of comics. So then I would just sit down and, and, you know, I try to find scripts online or in the back of like trade collections. And I would just draw, uh, pages and, you know, work on like, you know, pinup style things and whatever. And then, you know, everybody tells you like, Oh, you have to draw the actual interior pages of the comics. So I really set off on that. And then, the deeper I got into it, the more I realized, oh, this is like a full-time job before it's even a job, right? So mm -hmm. the time I was working in sales and I I had a lot of downtime. I worked for what used to be called Sleep Country, which I'm sure you're very well aware of being in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> um, it's Sleep Train or, or something else now. But um, so uh, I would just draw at work. And mm -hmm. then I realized um, that it was going to take more than that. So I quit that job and got a job working in a hotel doing room service. So I could make a little more working less because of tips. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would just draw at work and I would, I would get up at like, you know, seven, seven thirty in the morning. And I would draw until like three o'clock in the afternoon when I had to go to work from like four to midnight. And then I'd come home. Sometimes I'd draw for another hour or two. Then I'd go to bed and just start all over again. I did that for probably about four years until four or five years until I was able to finally start getting paid work. And part of that was that I, I met Chris Sabella and we started working on high crimes together. So we did that and that took us like three years in and of itself. So mm -hmm. um, I did get to a point where I was I was getting contacted by editors about doing paid work, but I had to finish that book first. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a a marathon to get it done while I was working the the room service job and I was also in school at the time so it was just this very long process of you know mm -hmm. finally getting to a point where I could leave the the day job and just do comics full time so mm -hmm. so what would you tell people that want to do this um this path I mean, I, I hear everybody with different views of how you should do it and how they got there. Yeah. Um, what would you suggest? Well, you know, we're in a really fortunate time for that because of the Internet, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. even when I was getting going, the Internet was obviously a huge thing. You know, this was like 2009 through probably 2011 that I was really like trying to break in and, you know, start mm -hmm. a book and stuff. And. At that point, though, you know, I had written and drawn my own little one shot thing and had it printed, printed through Kablam and sold it at conventions, you know. Um, so, you know, we're really lucky. We got that, some of those. What's that? I said, I think we got some of those. You might. Yeah, it was. I think we have some of your early, early days. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, because I think that was when I met like Allison and the crew and stuff mm -hmm, at Emerald mm -hmm. City. Yeah. So I started going to, to Emerald City um, and just tabling and doing commissions for people and you know mm -hmm. making prints and selling them and stuff um just to kind of get any kind of notice on that level mm -hmm. uh, and then you know that does help uh in the grand scheme of things but the, the biggest thing is just doing the work you know a lot of people have an idea that they want to do but they put it off because they play video games a lot or they you know it's just more fun to do like fun stuff and not you know chain yourself to a desk and work you know but mm -hmm. Really, that's what it takes, um, you know, as an artist specifically, you have to have, you know, art pages in a portfolio that show that you can do sequential art. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, you really just have to practice those chops and, and, you know, practice drawing people and environments and learn about perspective, you know, drawing things on the planes with which they mm -hmm. exist. Um, and, you know, if you can find someone to collaborate with and do a story with, that's great. If you want to write your own thing and do it, that's also great. You can find tons of scripts online to work from. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, one of the biggest things, especially now that you have web comics and you have print on demand and stuff, I always encourage people to just make a comic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because the nice thing is you don't need anyone's permission. 
And I think that's what a lot of people get stuck on is they're waiting for someone to give them the go ahead. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I found is that a lot of people at the time that I was looking to break in were um, doing independent stuff and then they were getting noticed by the big two and then they were getting drafted into the major league essentially, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I kind of decided that that was the route I wanted to take because, you know, you go to conventions and stand in line for portfolio reviews. And, you know, a lot of times at major conventions, uh, they'll have either a table that has like, you know, on, on Friday from, you know, one to three, Bob Shrek, and then <laughs> from, you know, four to six, CB Sabolski or, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And, mm -hmm. And uh, they'll they'll review your work and tell you what you should improve upon and what looks good and whatnot. And I found that I was getting so many conflicting uh, notes from so many people. Like one person might say, hey, I really like the way you draw faces, but I hate the way you draw cars. Right. And then the next person says, hey, great cars, but I don't really like your faces that much. And you're like, but the last person said, you know, <laughs> so I just realized, like, carve your own path and they'll come to you. You know, mm -hmm. um, so I think that is really the best way to do it. And you find your creative vo voice better that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that would be my advice. Like, just make your own stuff and, you know, understand that it's going to take a while and it's going to be tough and you're going to have to do it for free for a long time. But, you know, eventually, if you stick with it, uh, you know, I think I think most people who stick with it get good enough to do it for a living. You know, or at least professionally on some level, even if it's just their side thing while they work a, a you know, a day job. Because the reality is a lot of people have day jobs that pay well and they get health insurance and, you know, they can uh, support a family and, uh, and, you know, pay their mortgage with it. And comics is really a hustle. I mean, I've been doing it for going on almost probably eight years professionally now. And mm -hmm. I still work 80 hours a week, most weeks, you know? Mm -hmm. So if that's not your jam, you know, stick with the day job and, and, uh, you know, do it for fun. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the nice thing. Anyone can do it. And, and there are no rules or limitations to how. So. Um, so you were talking about being, uh, going to the cons and stuff like that. What's your, your favorite and least favorite part about hanging out in artist alley? Uh, definitely my favorite part is seeing people who I've become friends with at shows mm -hmm. over the years, like you guys and your staff, you know, um, other artists, obviously, you know, we all mostly interact on the internet. So it's fun to actually get together in person and, you know, who are your top seven artists and have those chats and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I think my least favorite part of it is just the sort of general marathon of it all. Yeah. Conventions are getting longer in in the number of days that, that they last and also the number of hours that the floor is open. And the number of people. Yes, uh, absolutely. Right. I mean, they, they just get more and more packed and it becomes a game of how do we organize the aisles so that this, you know, 70,000 people can shuffle through here in a day, you know, mm -hmm. Um and it's it's really taxing, you know, it's very tiring and you're on all day. So that can be difficult. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I I don't uh, I find that a lot of people will just leave their table for like a, a good chunk of the day. And, you know, I often get tabled next to people who do that. And then I see the same people coming back, hoping to catch them, you know, so. I always feel a responsibility to be at my table. So I'm really feeling that 12 hour day because I haven't, you know, I've gone to the bathroom or to get coffee real fast, you know? Um, and also, you know, if you're a guest of the show, I feel like it's kind of, you know, part of the deal. Like you should be there, you know? I agree. Yeah. A lot but, of respect for guys like you that do that. Well, thank you. And you know, what always ends up happening to me inevitably though, is the one time I go to the bathroom somebody's like oh I came by earlier and you weren't there and I'm like dude I've been here all day <laughs> like <laughs> you know so you're right that five minutes I I had to use the bathroom <laughs> yeah so but yeah there you know I don't do a ton of them every year because I you know I've got a wife and two dogs and and you know I, I just like being home with them and usually I have too much work to you know, be able to afford the time to to do too many shows. So I usually stick to just kind of like the Pacific Northwest ones. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So in that respect, I'm super lucky because Emerald City is a great show and it's, you know, not far from Portland where I live. And then we have Rose City, which I used to be able to walk to in my old place. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, I can be home in, in, in uh, on my couch, you know, in, in about 30, 40 minutes. So, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, once this uh, Humanoids book comes out, I'm going to, I'm looking to start doing more shows. Uh, so I may have a different answer for you, uh, you know, in a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. What about, uh, like, as far as your, your process when you're doing art, how does it change when it's your story and your collaboration versus the big two or, you know, yeah, kind of work for hire versus collaboration? It's a huge difference. I mean, I've done work for hire that I've also written. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, you know, I always, I use this analogy a lot. When you're working with a writer and I, and I do love the collaborative aspect of comics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but but when you're working from somebody else's idea, it's it's almost like they're they're picking out your clothes for you. Mm -hmm. Versus like if I had a job interview or a first date or something, I would want to put on the thing that I feel most confident in. Mm -hmm. When someone else is saying, "Hey, wear this and that together," I'd be like, "I don't know if that's like the best representation of me, right?" Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of times when you're working from a script. Um, if the idea doesn't generate from inside your own head, it can mm -hmm. be difficult to picture and, and try to guess what somebody else was thinking this mm -hmm. would go, you know? Um, and also it's, uh, it's not, it's just maybe not the way you would do it or you, I wouldn't have set that in this type of location cause I'm not good at drawing this kind of location or <laughs> I don't enjoy drawing this kind of location. Therefore this is going to be a slog, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so th that's the big difference is when you're, when it comes from your own head, you know, you also, you can't get mad at anyone, at anyone other than yourself, you know, like <laughs> I had some crowd scenes in, in my book that I mentioned and, uh, you know, it was my own fault. Like I did it to myself, you know, <laughs> so, you're like now I have to do this. <laughs> exactly. And of course I saved all the biggest, you know, hardest stuff to draw for the last chapter of the book. So, you know, I was, but it, you know, when it's again when it's your own thing it's like you're so proud of it right mm -hmm. everyone likes to think that you know their kids are like the nicest kids right <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's a little bit of that to it but mm -hmm. yeah i'd say that's the main difference is is um just a, a it's easier to do it when you thought of it mm -hmm. so speaking of of your darlings um what is your favorite scene in high crimes there are so many just like really solid like story parts and scenes and it's it's just so well crafted and put together i'm curious what your favorite scene is thank you um my favorite issue to draw was i believe the well i say issue because it came out digitally uh first um chapter by chapter and then it all got put into a, a collected edition but um the third chapter was my favorite overall to draw because I think it just had the most action up until that point. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, art is kind of like um, when you're when you're drawing, you ha you have this picture in your head of how it should look, right? Mm -hmm. And you have what you're actually capable of doing. And <laughs> I feel like being an artist is just trying to like close that gap, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think in that book specifically, that third chapter was probably the closest I got to closing the gap you know mm -hmm. um but then my favorite specific scene I think was probably um ah, that's a tough one because I love we did a big chase scene through Katmandu in mm -hmm. the um in the third issue or third chapter and then in the fifth or sixth we did a thing there there's a there's a like a glacier on Everest called the Kungu Icefall. Mm -hmm. And it's this like shoots and ladders thing where the Sherpas will literally take aluminum ladders and and like run them across these huge gaps, you know, where you can fall into this huge crevasse and stuff. And uh, we did a we did a scene through that that was a bit of a chase scene, but then at one point you turn the book landscape and then you're reading it almost like a calendar, you know, mm -hmm. went widescreen and then you turn it back. So I think that was probably my favorite scene 
uh, just because it was really fun to do. And also conceptually, I feel like we did something cool that, you know, you don't see a lot. Mm-hmm. What, uh, where did the idea come from? Uh, Chris Sabella is just a mad genius. Like I, <laughs> uh, I, I came on board because, um, I was part of a, a studio that used to be called Tranquility Base here in Portland um, that has since been sort of mm-hmm. absorbed by Helioscope. Um, mm-hmm. And Joe Keating, uh, who's a writer probably a lot of people know, uh, was a member there. And I was just getting started, and um, I, uh, I, I turned to him one day and I said, hey, man, you know, because he knew a lot of people in comics. I said, if you know anyone who's looking for an artist to collaborate with, because uh, at the time I, I had a very binary idea like oh you're either an artist or a writer you don't do both you know I've since like found oh it's actually the most fun to write for yourself <laughs> um, so I was looking to collaborate with somebody and uh, he said you know what kind of stuff do you want to do I said I love crime stories right so about a week or two later uh, he brought Chris Sabella by the studio they'd been hanging out that morning and uh, and he said hey like you guys should talk and then so Chris just stood there at my desk and said, yeah, so I have this idea for a book. And he just told me, you know, it's about grave robbers on Mount Everest. And uh, they, you know, they steal hands and fingerprint the bodies and find out who they are and extort them for a, a retrieval fee, like their families, whatever. And one of the bodies they find is like a spy who was on the run and, you know, it hits the fan. And I was just like, that's what? Like, that's brilliant. Like, how did you even come up with that? You know? And I think he, if I remember correctly, he told me that he was reading John Krakauer's book Into Thin Air, mm-hmm. Climbing Everest, and um, they talk about that Kumbu Icefall, and he said, wouldn't it be cool to stage like a shootout there in his head, right? Mm-hmm. And then I think the story just kind of unfolded from there. So, um, yeah, but I was, I mean, instantly, I was just like, that's brilliant, you know, because mm-hmm. I love crime stories and I love even more like a high concept crime story. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'd never heard anything like it. And it was just like a no brainer to me. Mm-hmm. And I, and he also had, uh, you know, essentially like a green light from Monkey Brain, which was the digital publisher that put it out initially. Um, so he was just looking for an artist, essentially, and, and it was a go. So I wrapped up a project I was doing at the time, and then I immediately hit the ground running on that. And then, uh, yeah, it was just, you know, like climbing a mountain to get it done after that. But <laughs> So it's cool. It's it's a uh, it's fantastic. I just love it. It's Thank you. Awesome. Um, what? Uh, so, high adventure. Moving on to James Bond. Yeah. How's that writing. Oh, or James drawing, Bond. Yeah. I'm such a huge <laughs> James Bond fan. I don't have it up anymore because it. I. I moved about a year ago, and in our new newer place, I didn't have anywhere to put it. But in my old office, I had a life-size car- cardboard cutout of Timothy Dalton. Nice. You know, I've got my Bond uh, shelves of, you know, books and miniature Aston Martins and action figures of Bond that I've made and stuff. And mm-hmm. um, I love the movies. And so so getting to do the book was, you know, awesome. I How it came about was, um, you know, I knew Dynamite had the license. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it was at Emerald City. I don't remember what year it was. Probably 20. 14 2015 at this point um i had done like a john wick commission for somebody Mm. and uh i was talking to jeff parker and he goes hey you should find out who has the license for that and this is before dynamite was doing john wick Mm -hmm. and uh and i was like hey speaking of licensing you do stuff at dynamite right and he's like yeah and i said do you know who's editing the james bond books and he was like i do and i'm actually gonna do one and i was like can i draw it (laughs) <laughs> and he was like yeah <laughs> so um so that was james bond origin which which jeff and i co-wrote part of it he he did he did six issues with bob quinn mm-hmm. uh, and then i came on and actually i was supposed to launch that book but timing got wonky and there were a lot of delays in, in mm-hmm. getting that book going so they brought bob in to do the first half to set the bar super high <laughs> that i was gonna have to follow um, but in that time of developing that, uh, the editor was like, hey, you know, we have a, a holiday special coming up. Uh, do you want to pitch something for it? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so I think 
the same day I sent him the pitch for for uh, the book I ended up doing, which was uh, called James Bond Solstice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we got it approved and it was off to the races. And that was up until this humanoids book. That was my I think my favorite thing I got to do creatively because I got to write a James Bond story. You know, it was mm-hmm. an oversized one shot. So I had a little extra room to play. Mm hmm. Uh, you know, I got to tell like the kind of story I'd want to do. It was very much, uh, you know, an homage to the Fleming stuff. Cause I'm, as much as I love the movies, I really love the books too. Mm-hmm. And that was the version I was interested in trying to adapt for, you know, uh, the comic page. So, um, and you know, of course there was the Warren Ellis run before that and Andy Diggle's stuff that I just absolutely loved. It was, it was some of my favorite comics to come out in the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it was like a huge dream come true. What's your favorite Bond story? Um, in the comics or just in general, your favorite story overall? Uh, you know that's a tough one because the the first book, Casino Royale, is mm-hmm. so good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually really love Moonraker, which is the third book. Mm-hmm. It's vastly different from the movie. <laughs> uh, with the I'm movie, a good, very favorite. very big James Bond fan. Yeah. Um, so you've probably seen. Uh, oh, I've seen all. My my yeah. father was a huge Bond fan too. I've read all the books. I've seen all the movies. Yeah. Um, um, Royal is is probably my favorite. Right. It's just so good. I mean, it's it's crazy that it was so fully formed in its first outing. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as the comics go, my favorite uh, of those was um, Hammerhead, which was. Uh, Andy Diggle and the artist was Luca Castellanguida, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just, I mean, Andy Diggle is for my money, the best like espionage action writer in comics. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and the art was phenomenal in that book. And I just loved every page of it. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorite Bond movie is Skyfall. Really? Yeah. Um, I think Casino Royale is the best one. But Skyfall is my favorite one. It just like it was such an experience in the theater for me, and it 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 just it's so beautiful. Like the cinematography by Roger Deakins, and like mm-hmm. um, I loved the story. You know, I know people have their issues with it, and they say there are plot holes, and I don't care. It's so you know. <laughs> I actually love Quantum of Solace too. I think that movie is vastly underrated. I think Skyfall is a love letter to Bond fans from the books is what it feels like. And it feels like those plot holes exist uh, for people that don't have the fully fleshed Bond history all up in their brain. Agreed. So you wouldn't even know what the plot holes were because it wouldn't stand out to you. That's why I've never seen any. I'm like, (laughs) yeah, I get it. I don't know what's missing. (laughs) I I like Casino Royale because he's very much a blunt instrument, not a scalpel. I, uh, I, I love that version of him. Like it, the parkour scene in the beginning where he's just like, I'll just go through it. Yeah. It's cute that you're flipping around, but I'm just going to go right through this. Yeah. Like when he busts through the wall, mm-hmm. you know, he busts mm-hmm. that drywall. That's like the perfect encapsulation of that. Mm-hmm. And it's, so, I mean, it, it really is a perfect movie. Like there's, you can't pick it apart. There's nothing, there are no, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, at mm-hmm. least not that I've found it. I've seen it a few times. <laughs> <laughs> One or twice. So mm-hmm. who's your favorite uh, Bond then? Uh, Timothy Dalton. I was going to guess that. What with the fact that you had a uh, yeah. stand up? My wife got it for me because of that. You know, uh-huh. uh, I just, you know, I love Daniel Craig. I mean, I think he's a fantastic Bond. I think he's the best Bond, mm-hmm. but Timothy Dalton is my favorite. He looks exactly like uh, Fleming described Bond. Mm-hmm. He was the perfect sort of blend of suave, but also like, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of a lighter touch of humanity in him than, than the other, you know, but in a, in a more serious way, like I, I feel like Connery was great, you know, and he was the first one. So obviously you have to tip your hat to that. Um, I thought Lazenby uh, was good. And, you know, if we got more with him, that would have been cool. But, you know, he had the very tough position of being the follow the guy to follow Connery. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then so Roger Moore comes in and he's got that buffer and then for whatever reason I think all the all the fans of the Connery Bond got to share Roger Moore with their kids mm-hmm. 
because enough time had passed. So you get a lot of more love because he is the bond of an entire generation. Mm-hmm. Well, and wasn't Lazenby her uh, honor majesty's yeah. whatever and, and his wife dies? Yeah. That, that kind of shoots bond for a while and people. Right. So I feel like that's kind of unfortunate for Lazenby. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of people when they actually go back to watch that movie again, uh, many mm-hmm. people haven't even seen it. They're like, oh, that was actually pretty good. You know, it's a little goofy, mm-hmm. but they all were back then, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you know, I I think Dalton was doing what what Daniel Craig did, but mm-hmm. he had the unfortunate position of following the beloved Roger Moore, who was much more jokey, and you know, he just kind of stood around in his bell bottoms. He didn't do a lot of action, you know. And then mm-hmm. you had Dalton, who was in there doing his own stunts, and you know, he's this like Shakespearean stage actor who is like really just injecting this realism and and grit into Bond. And I think people were like, that's not Bond. There's supposed to be a slide whistle when a car goes through a loop, you know, and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, um, yeah, and then, you know, Brosnan, I think, was uh, kind of trying to do all of the Bonds in one. And I think that, uh, you know, that made his run seem a little more confused. Um. But uh, he, I, you know, I love Pierce Brosnan. I just, I don't, his movies aren't my favorite. I really do like The World Is Not Enough. I I feel like that one gets undersold. It's like, I think beat for beat, it's the best of his movies. I, yeah, I know people love Goldeneye. I find it to be kind of boring, to be honest. (laughs) I'm usually just sitting there like, when is this going to, you know? Um, So yeah, that's my treatise on James Bond. (laughs) I should have known when I asked for a specific. You're like, oh, no, no. We got to go yeah. through every single one of them. You open it. Um, no. <laughs> uh, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Um, not that I can think of. Um, I'm excited to be able to talk about my my next project. when. Uh, and when is that going to announce? I don't know. I know it's it, it was initially supposed to come out in September. And then now it's looking like January of next year, just because they wanted to give time for everything to settle, which I'm very grateful for because, you know, trying to release a book on the tales of, you know, an economic disaster is not really no. something I was looking forward to. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait then. Well, I mean, so they're talking about pushing free comic day and, and that it's only postponed right now. Um, are, are you going to maybe be able to announce it then? Yeah, I mean, the there was supposed to be a preview. Oh, they were going to run the cover and the first four pages of the book mm-hmm. in their free comic book day issue. Um, at the time, we didn't have... I was pretty far along, but colors weren't that far along yet. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to run the, the colored pages, and at that time, it was like the first four. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm finished with the book now, and the colorist is is moving along, so... I don't know if that changes what ends up being in the free comic book day issue or not, or if they already sent those files off. I think they're already off. Okay. Just, just from a retailer point of view, I, I think they're already off. Cause we've already gotten sense. some of our free comic day stuff. Oh, you already received some? So yeah, I can't give it out until yeah. the free comic day, but we've already received some of them. I'm totally going to go see if any of them are humanoids. Yeah. <laughs> So what is the are are is Diamond is supposed to start shipping again uh, at the end of May? Middle roughly? of May. Middle of well, May. May twentieth, I think, is our first date. Yeah. So is um, that like going to be all the backlog of stuff, or still have not announced exactly how that's going to work? My suspicion is that with DC, it's going to get glutted because DC did this thing where they um um. Actually, do you mind if we stop recording? Oh, sure, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so thank you for being a part of our free yeah. comic day. Thank and you. Uh, it is our first virtual. And I'm really looking forward to Humanoids book because I love Humanoids and your work is always awesome. So um, thank you again. Thank and I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>